All right, what's going on? Now, we've seen enough of the G60 for the moment. Let's see what's been happening with the Defender. Marco, got some questions. First one is, who's the beardless fuck? Yeah, that'd be me. It's been a while, so it's been four years since I've had a shave. All right, now, before we get into what's changed on the Defender, let's just wind it back a second and just get back onto what actually happened with the Defender when it broke down coming home from Fraser. So timing belt. That's what are the sucks. chances? God. Have you seen our roof nets? So these things are for sale on our website, sidetrackedaustralia.com.au. These are the best option for storing your hats, jackets, jumpers, stuff like that when you go away. Got two sizes available, one good for the wagons here, as you can see. Also a smaller one for the dual cab utes, so check them out. This is the 300 TDI, they have a timing belt. They recommend changing it at about every 80,000 Ks. I left it 90,000 Ks. And that clicked over coming home from Fraser Island. So it uh, basically, it wears, it turns into dust essentially. Um, the beautiful thing about these engines is they're interference engines. So all it did was basically bend some push rods. Um, so I was back up on the road, uh, what was about maybe a grand or 1500 bucks and a week later. So um, no massive damage there, obviously coming home from a vehicle broken down in the middle of outback New South Wales was a pain in the ass. Did you, sorry Marco, did you rebuild it? No, actually got uh, a company here in Adelaide, um, they are Land Rover specialists. They are called PCB Land Rover. He's helped me out a few times. I believe it's Peter down there. Um, very helpful. Um, and he did squeeze me in short notice too. So couldn't appreciate um, or couldn't thank him anymore. What yep. actually happened when it snapped? Oh yeah, so driving along at 110 and then uh, a couple of loud hissing, banging sounds coming from the front end and then no power, nothing. So quietly come to a stop in the middle of uh, outback New South Wales. One last thing with the 300 TDI in the Defender. So for those- Sorry Mark, before you, <coughs> why the 300 TDI? But the 300 TDI is pretty well the last of the engines that did not have any electronics um, throughout it. So it's a very basic. Uh, mechanical fuel pump, very simple engine. Um, and that was just to get back to basics a bit. I wanted a bit of a tractor. I wanted something e simple. Power has never really been a massive um, thing for me. I didn't need to go fast in my four-wheel drive. I've, I've had road bikes um, and fast cars and stuff like that. So it's not, I haven't, it'd be great, but I can't afford to have a huge full drive with an LS and still expect to get good fuel efficiency and um, travel the country reliably and that kind of thing. So there has been some questions on the socials, Marco, <laughs> about the turbo kit. Uh, quite a few questions. Yeah, actually, the the M and D turbo kit is from the UK. There's a few companies that do a aftermarket turbo. It's a VNT turbo. Um, I've done that. The intercooler. Um, it's been. It definitely saw an, an increase in like drivability. It's hard to explain. I still haven't fully tuned. The vehicle either so it's not even seeing its potential not that it's that extreme um we're not talking any any massive gains uh the kit was awesome so pretty much everything i needed turbo exhaust manifold exhaust dump pipe everything bolted up really nice um it was a really good kit so that was m d engineering in the uk um would definitely recommend after you after you obviously shut the bed on the side of the road yep what was the what was the, how'd you, how'd you get home? Well, we were considered, we had no mobile reception. So uh, if you saw the Fraser series, if you didn't, you should be subscribed. So you do catch up with uh, all our trip videos um, and everything else that's going on. Uh, Nick towed me, what, maybe 600 Ks? I nearly got the record. Yeah, you were nowhere near, <laughs> nowhere near the record. It was 650, I reckon. Yeah, Matt towed me 700 plus Ks in the Jeep once. Um, so Nick was going for that record. So I reckon I got 650. Yeah, that I was from above Burke to Broken, uh, Hill. Broken Hill. Yeah. And so Matt got in the Hilux. The Jeep was from... Cooper PD to Alice Springs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Yeah, not, not proud moments, but... Um, and then from uh, Broken Hill, threw it on a trailer, uh, got it back to Adelaide. And I mean, I also cop a lot of shit because everyone's wanting, everyone's wanting to know how many times it's been on tilt tray. It's been on the trailer once on that trip home from 
Fraser, and on a tilt tray once coming home from Robe. Um, that was due to a aftermarket part, so it was the drive shaft, the mud shield on that had come loose, and it was spinning at high speed, squealing really loudly, but we could not find what it was. It sounded horrendous, thought it was gearbox or um, clutch related. Put it on a tilt tray just to be safe, um, turned out to be nothing. So wasted a, um, a 400 kilometer tow there. So that's the only major issues. Look, we did do a, and be, you know, mind you, in two and a half years, has been to Brisbane twice, Perth twice. So I've done a lot of kilometers. Questions we also got were, why did you go away from the Jeep and how does it compare to the Jeep? Obviously they're pretty similar vehicles in the sense that solid axle, coil sprung, so, you know, some of the best. Um, Off-road, these vehicles is where they should live. Um, neither of them are great as daily you know, used vehicles. The Jeep Wrangler is probably better as a daily, without a doubt. This is horrible as a daily. Um, maybe stock, these things would be all right, um, but modified to this extent, uh, you're probably pretty silly to drive it that far every day. The Jeep was great off-road, especially on 33s and unlocked. That thing went a lot of places and they can, they can outwheel most vehicles out there um, size for size. So. Um, throw lockers, throw big tires on it like everyone does for every vehicle and they're, they're bloody capable. However, the electrics blowing up not only the diesel but also the petrol um, in both the Wranglers that I had, that was enough for me. I'd be silly to go back to one of them anytime soon, although I do miss them. Um, I would still like one again one day, but I certainly wouldn't rely on it as an overland rig. Um. So far, I know we'll get into what you've done recently. Mm -hmm. uh, worst mod you've done. Worst mod? Or if you were to do it again, what would you do differently? Is that a better way of putting it? Yeah, probably. Um, honestly, I probably would have... I'm still up in the air about 35s, to be honest. You want to go 37s? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, 33s, I think, would still be... I mean, for what we've done so far... 33s would be more than enough. Um, it's, it's when you're in Tassie, when you're like, oh, we need big, bigger wheels, um, you know, up the Cape, it's nice, but it's not, not really essential. Um, the reason for smaller, is it a center of gravity thing? Is yeah, it a... it's, you're lower, the fuel efficiency is better. It's a lot more comfortable. Um, you have nearly rolled it twice, haven't you? Yeah, that's true. I have nearly rolled it twice. So that's one was very, very close. One well, was saved by a tree that we were thought about cutting down. Once again, if you haven't seen it, it's on the Bendleby Ronnie Dale episode. Yep, exactly. Um, uh, and the other mod is probably going off road. Like we went to Coffs and it was terrible because of the big tyres, because it hadn't been regeared. It was absolutely shocking. It was almost dangerous. Um, and it was a fun experience, but it was a waste of time. So if I would do anything. Again, it would have probably been not gone to coughs until I had done the re-gear and lockers. So finally, I've been able to afford, that's been the biggest thing, not afford it and also get hold of some parts because during COVID, everyone knows, parts have been impossible to get in Australia. Um, finally got, uh, what, gears front and rear. Uh, so these are geared to, um, I think it's 3.54 is the factory gearing. Um, I've gone up to 4.11s front and rear, uh, and this has a Salisbury in the rear, so that makes things harder. Um, they were a heavy duty rear axle in only some models. Um, and yeah, they're, they're a pain in the ass to get parts for. So finally got those, um, got a hold of a locker in the front. Um, Where'd you go? Air. So I've gone on an air locker. Um, it's a Ashcroft locker. Looked at a lot of options. Um, Ashcroft just kept coming back as the number one uh, way to go. Uh, E-locker, and I know everyone's gonna have their own opinion on lockers, and you can ask probably 10 different people and they'll give you 10 different answers. Everyone knows that ARBs are notorious for leaking and oil problems, seal problems. Um, and I was gonna go that way, but then you speak to experts. I just wanted an expert's opinion um, that install these things day in, day out. And You don't listen to Jeffrey on the forum. <laughs> yeah, look, those Facebook warriors are um, always very helpful. Um, but yeah, the, the people that kind of deal with them day in, day out, everything I came back to was Ashcroft was the way to go. Um, the rear, again, I 
there is locker options available. I couldn't afford an e-locker. They're like three and a half grand for an e-locker for the rear, if you can even find one. Um, so, and I didn't want anything else other than something that was gonna be, I didn't wanna put a ARB locker in and then have problems with it. I'd rather put a ATB in, so that's what I did. It's a, essentially an LSD of sorts, so meant to be a little bit better. Not perfect with something like as old as this because it has, doesn't have traction control. If your vehicle has traction control, an ATB is, from what I've heard, um, a pretty good option. So with re-gearing, obviously, well, not obvious to uh, the viewers, but obvious to me, you haven't done any off-roading. It's only literally gone in like a week ago, finished yeah. the job. Um, you did most of it yourself. You did all of it yourself. Yeah, so I've fitted everything myself, which is a bit of a problem because I've never done it before. <laughs> Um, I've done maybe 200 k's since, so I'm just betting in the gears at the moment. Um, so hey, I've done something right, it drives. Um, it was a learning curve and it took a long time. It's not as simple in the rear as just pulling the diff center and giving it to someone either, is it? No, the rear has preload on the bearings thanks to the casing. Um, so you've got to spread the casing to even get the center out. So it's, it's an ugly job and I'd hate to do it again, so I hope I don't have to. Um, as well as gears, obviously, then you're putting a lot more pressure, and with lockers, you're putting a lot more pressure on the other driveline components. So I've gone and put uh, maxi drive axles in the front um, with heavy duty CVs. So I've got Raptor CVs and heavy duty um, drive flanges as well. I've already had the maxi drive axles in the rear and the heavy duty drive flanges. Well, here's one that's not actually related to Defender, but what happened to the Austro RTT? No longer a fan? Oh, good question. The rooftop tent? Um, no, nah, that's still in the shed. You so. can probably see it in this frame if you're closely looking. Yeah, if you look close enough, it's probably against the wall up here. No, nah, the James Brood sold, so I only got the Oz Trail now. So next trip, she'll probably be on. Um, I think we've probably covered most of them. Leaky LT230. Yeah, so the LT230 is the transfer case in these things. Um, they ran the LT230 for, I don't know, like 20, 25 years or something like that. Pretty good transfer case, actually. Um, they leak oil a lot. Uh, mine has not leaked, I don't think, a drip since I've had it. So no oil leaks in this bad boy, mate. Um, from Leon, fellow 300 TDI Defender owner from YouTube as well. Um, he's got a couple of questions we've covered most. Oh, yeah. What's the best thing for you about driving a Defender? The, oh, great question. The Defender for me is just, honestly, it's the look of it. Like these things on the road, they're classic look. There's, to me, if you were to paint a picture of a four wheel drive, like to go down in the history books, it would be a Defender. Um, another one, James, daily driver. Good, bad. Do you need to do any work to it? I know you said it was a tractor earlier. It, yeah, it's a tractor. You, this, it's comfortable now, and honestly, I drove a 79 home from work today, um, so I spent a couple hours in that today. Um, this, as it is now, is more comfortable than a, uh, a 2022 79. Obviously, I've spent a lot of money on upgrades, um, so it's hard to compare a stock 79 with upgraded Defender, but um, it'd be tough to daily this. It's, yeah, it's very high. I mean, I don't even have side steps or anything like that. So there's still things you can do. Um, a stock one, no worries. A stock Defender, you could certainly, you could daily it, but I don't know. That is all. It's just a quick recap on what's been happening with the Defender. It's a uh, real test will be in a couple of weeks time when we take it off road.